this week we're going to be doing a, a a kind of summary of chapter 10 of the book which is a relatively short chapter but contains some stuff related to kind of um how to design your code such that it's easier for users to to, to work with i guess um uh the this is the final chapter in part two of the book javascript for r which is something we've been doing a, a book club on and the videos are all getting posted on youtube so if anyone's watching on youtube we're reading working through um the book javascript for r as part of the r for data science um slack community um great okay so um so i've put together some notes on the chapter um a lot of the examples in it are a kind of extension of this um gio um package that's built during the um the the this part of the book um i'll hold on i'll share my screen so that it's less weird um here right okay um Sharing, sharing, sharing. Okay. 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 Is my screen up for everyone? Hopefully. How are we doing? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so how did everyone find this chapter um, as a kind of just just in general, Arthur or, or Lucio, are you, have you worked through the content? Oh, hold on, I've not got the chat up. No? Okay. Um, yes, so anyway, um, I'll, 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 I'll show how it kind of comes together um okay so um one of the thing the, the there's three main sections of this chapter um when once we've got through them and i've shown the kind of example code and things like that um i'll do a little summary of the this part of the book as a whole um the um so we've been working to build a um, a package that makes the Gio um, visualization library available to our users, um, and with that we are able to make um, graphics that look like. Um, where's the example? With that, we're able to make graphics that look like this. Um, so the it's a way of kind of connecting countries on the globe and kind of illustrating flows of commodity or, or something from one country to another. Um, one of the issues we've got so far is that the function that we have built oh i'll show um how it works at present we have a function that has a signature that looks like this so you pass in a data frame and with the data within that it will um it will do any necessary kind of transformations of that data frame send them over to, send it over to javascript in a json format and then in the browser um the data within that data frame will be um kind of um added to a gio object and and um the the necessary visualization will be built in the browser um 
an issue we've got here is that the, the data frame has to be of a very specific form. So um, it must have specific columns, E, I, and V, the, the first two being um, kind of um, uh, country codes, kind of ISO two letter codes for um, countries and the V being a, a value um, to, to kind of dictate the size of the arc that joins those two countries. Um, and in R, there are a load of different ways whereby you can call a function that reaches into a data frame. So for example, from ggplot2, there's two main functions that you can, where if you specify a data argument, you're able to um, use the name of the column within that data frame that you're interested in uh, to generate a plot. So here you're using the, 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 the column name as a symbol. Um, and, and similarly in ggplot2, although it's slightly more complicated, in this aesthetic mapping, you can refer to columns from that data frame. And even in base R, you can do something similar with, with the plot function. You have this um, formula syntax, which allows you to refer to columns in the same way. Um, the alternative way of using plot is to like extract the, the values that you need for plotting on the x-axis and the values that you need for plotting on the y-axis, but it's a little bit, um, uh, it, 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 you, you have, <laughs> anyway. So there's a few different ways of, of calling visualization functions in R. Um, and what would be nice to be able to do is to pass in the data frame that we're working with and also it indicates to R which columns in that data frame we want to plot out on the, um, in, the in the visualization because you know you might have you might want to illustrate um, you might want two different visualizations built on the same data frame one showing um, you know um, kind of monetary movements and one showing like population movements or something like that. Um, or, um, well, yeah, it's just, uh, it makes it easier for the user if they don't have to kind of set up their data it, such that it's compatible with your function because they may be using that data in other functions. So what we're gonna do is we're going to expand the, the, the kind of um, signature of the, the function that we use to call this um, GIO library. Um, so this is a function within, our, with, within the R package that we're building. Um, and what we're going to do is add these three additional parameters to the function signature one that Ill indicates which column of the passed in data frame corresponds to the, um, where the arcs in the plot should start and which one corresponds to where those arcs should end and which of the columns in the data frame corresponds to the, you know, the value that should be presented. So the, the overarching thing here is making it easy for your user to use their data in whatever form it's in with your function. Um, the, so that, so the, some new parameters, the way that we can, we, we can make the function work. So if I can show you the, um, the original, uh, the form of the package as it was, if I, um, Right, so 
this is the form of the R function that we'd been building a, co a couple of weeks ago. I didn't really update it, but basically all it's doing is taking a data frame in, creating, making a list that contains that data frame, and then um, passing that list of data um, to the, um, the, you know, the JavaScript library. Um, the data within here gets converted to JSON and, and things in the, the appropriate way, um, and then um, gets plotted. So, for example, we can do tools load all. Now, for those, uh, I don't think Lucio was here when I presented this package, and I've I've given the function a slightly different name to the name in the book, and I've given the package a different name from the name in the book. Um, just to kind of be to test myself really um right so if i do um what would be a good i think i had some example data in here maybe not um, So if I do x equals data frame, equals yes, do, and then do, did I load it? Yeah, um, new GIR on x. That'll work. It doesn't quite work in my viewer here, so I'll just have to pull it from a browser. So that, in its current form, you're passing in the, the data frame, and with it, you're able to plot a, this, this connection from China to the USA. Um, what we want to do is modify it so that um, your user can have their data in their own form and specify which columns they want to, to, to work with within your function. Um, so to do that, I'll um, just a sec. Um, ignore these dots for the minute. Um, so I've added in this source, target, and value parameters. I should probably document them as well. Um, but all we're doing is now the user will pass in their data and we're using kind of tidy selection to extract to kind of create the i e and v columns of of, of a uh, sorry create a data frame that contains columns called i e and v from the original data frame by extracting these particular columns. Um, so as far as the JavaScript side's concerned, the data that's passed over to it will be as it was when it was, you know, when, when we forced the user to pass in a data frame of a particular st structure. Um, but on the R side, you can have your data in a, you know, a, a data frame containing as many columns as you want with as whatever names you want. Um, okay, so I'll show that that still works. Um, where are we? There's an example somewhere. So if I, where did I put my example? Sorry, I'll be, I'll only be a second. weird oh well, maybe i didn't right okay i'll just use the example from the book um so there's um something there's a few things in here that like tripped me up when i was coding this up so um like I, I, there's a yeah so there's a an example like countries let's see 
So you're making a bunch of countries, US, um, Belgium, France, and Germany, and you're making a data frame such that we've got from equals countries to equals reverse countries and um, traded equals four. Right, so with that, um, if I load everything back up, um and i can now run new gio on df when and now i can specify source equals from target equals to and value equals traded so this is the same kind of sort of the same kind of approach that you would use if you're writing kind of tidyverse style code so you're specifying columns within a data frame um i'll have to show you that now i'll show you what tripped me up here um so i was working through this code and and then this came up with china highlighted and there was like no arcs or anything and um, it was only when I realized that you have to kind of click on one of the countries whose arcs are present in your data set um, that the, their data will become vi visible. Um, and it actually mentions a, a little bit related to that in, in a later section of this chapter. Um, so, um, so that's... Um, USA to Germany, I guess. So if we get France, it's not really, is it possible to zoom in? Um, anyway, um, so, so now we've made the function on the R side a bit easier for the user to work with um, by pushing the complexity of, you know, different people's data structures into our function in, in, by handling that ourselves. Um, the, uh, hold on, where are my notes? I'll bring them back over. Uh, what was it again? So yeah, it's, it, it, so this section is kind of it, advice on how to make your function a little bit easier to use um, and you could imagine that um, oh yeah so um, there's a few things that aren't quite handled by the code as it is in the um, in the book now whether these are like design choices that you might subsequently want to consider so for example you could um envisage a point where you your users might call your function and specify a column that doesn't exist in their data frame and perhaps your function ought to throw an error when they do that maybe um it might they might call your function and want to modify the values or compute new values as as they call your function. And I, I'm fairly certain we can't do that at the moment. Um, but, uh, and also whether there should be like a kind of default um, choice of columns um, if the user doesn't specify them. Similarly to how, um, I think it's tidy graph, will use the first three columns of a data frame to define the edges if the user doesn't specify um, um, the columns that those edges should be defined by. But um, anyway, um, so these are further decisions that you might make. So I'll, I'll show you that as a kind of example. So um, if I call um, source equals not present, 
well, that work, that that does throw an arrow, which is good uh, as a result of dplyr not being able to find um, this particular column, um, so that we get that by um, we get that for free. Um, yeah, uh, here's an issue that we might kind of think about implementing maybe it would be useful to be able to allow you know similarly to how in ggplot2 you can modify the um you can you know combine columns together to create a, a value that you plot out further design decisions anyway um so right where are we so the next thing, um, so I had a look at a few different libraries, and there's a few mentioned at the end of this chapter, um, chart.js and cytoscape.js. Some of these libraries are absolutely huge. Um, I used to work with Cytoscape when it was a desktop application. It may well still be, um, but that's like, I don't know, before 2010, so um a long time ago really um but the 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 scope to do stuff within some of these libraries is is so huge that um that um if you're trying to implement an r package that wraps one of these libraries it it you there'll be options available in javascript that um, your users may want to be able to use from R. Um, and this, the second section of this chapter kind of discusses um, the, um, what is the, 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 the kind of simplest way that you can make those um options available to your users so for example um in the gio uh library we had html docs configure we had we have these so your users uh, sorry the users of this library can specify a few different things that will modify how the um, images look at the end of the day. So, for example, this is the um, the root cause of, of of why I found it strange that there were no arcs showing when I when I initially made that uh, image earlier on. So, by default, the uh, when you when you create a new visualization with Jio, it will focus in on China initially. And if there are no arcs coming out of or into China, then no arcs will be displayed on in, in, in the, the, the visualization. So you have to kind of squirrel around and find the country that you're interested in. Um, but there's many other options. So there's these kind of configurable um, arguments can then be passed into the um, the the GIO object that you um, refer to in your JavaScript code. Um, but the the config, I mean, it just looks like a nested list, and basically you could readily create this data structure in R, convert it to JSON and transfer that to javascript um so uh one of the recommendations in this uh chapter is to um use uh, to allow your users to um pass in options convert those options into a list and then kind of pass them over. And the, a simple way to do that in R is to use this um, ellipsis um, variable uh, parameter. 
Um, so, um, so the way it works, if you, um, uh, for those who haven't done this before, um, if you have a function with this ellipsis variable in the, the, the parameter list, it means that your users can pass in any arguments they want. Um, so for example, if you look at the, the, the signature for like um, D play R select, um, this is why you don't have to specify, you, you know, you can specify your data argument and then two, three, four, five more arguments in your call to D play R select. Um, the, the, you know, the, the collection of values that are passed into your function can be converted over into a list. Um, and here we're just kind of printing out what happens when the user calls that. So if, if I call this function with, and only pass in the value one, it will make a list where the first entry in the first, sorry, where the first entry of that list just contains a vector containing one. If I call a function like this, we'll end up with an entry in that list for each of the arguments that's passed. Um, right. Um, so we can use this, though, um, in our R code. So here, um, by including this in the parameter list for the function that we're building to, to call Gile, um, so at present, the user has to specify their data and then the relevant columns that they want to want the function to work on. By passing in any further arguments, um, what we're doing is we're going to convert those additional arguments into a list and attach it to this configs um, uh, element of, of, of a list. And then um, when we send that data to the JavaScript side, it will be able to access that configs element. Um, so if we look at how the JavaScript code changes, um, the only difference between the initial version where you're just passing the data in and, and this one with the, the configured uh, values is that you have, you can either call this method configure on the controller object, or you can um, add in the x.configs, something like that, um, at, at initiation. But the, again, this is, this is just a kind of example of how to how to use this idea whereby all we're doing is kind of providing the user a a way to pass additional optional kind of things over to a javascript library via the r function that you're creating um so yeah so um so with that um what was i doing um new child so if i do that when this opens we have china as the initial country now i can modify that now um i just have to remember how to do it um so it's something like control equals list in it country equals USA. I think that's right. And now when and now the I've passed in that initial country argument over to this GIO um, library. So that's just like, you know, that's one change to the parameter list one line in the R function and one line in the JavaScript side that makes all the kind of configurable um, 
side of, of, of Jio available to your users from R. Um, but as I said, some, some, some of these libraries are so huge that um, even with that, it might be <laughs> quite, a, quite a difficult thing to work with. Um, yes, um, so that's uh, how to kind of a, a way of handing options over to um, a, a JavaScript library. Um, yes, I mean, there are alternatives, though. I mean, you could hard code into your um, function parameters that, you know, there was to be a control and there was to be a color option and there was a brightness option. But if you, if you hard code those kind of things into your function definition in R, if the API changes, um, you know, if, if, if the API for Jio changed or an additional set of options, uh, of configurable options were made, you would have to then change your function definition to make the, uh, the Jio's changes available to your users. So by, um, because we didn't hard code the names of the different option types that are being passed over by using this ellipsis parameter. Um, um, the functions that we've written should be able to handle expansions and contractions in the configurability of, of, of a JavaScript library that we've worked with, I think at least. Um, what was the alternative I did? Yeah, okay, right. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, and this is just how you'd use it. But they, some of this code, some of this is specific to G Gio, but I'm trying to kind of tease out the bits that are, would be useful were you wrapping any of the kind of example libraries that are mentioned at the end of the, the, the chapter? Okay. Um, then the third section was about interface design. Um, and this is a, a kind of extension of that again. So this is like, um, you're trying to make your R function as, um, you're trying to make it make the as much of the library available to your users as possible with as little maintenance burden as possible on your side, but you're also trying to make it as easy to use as possible for your users. Um, and part of that might be, you know, not imposing constraints on the structure of the data that your users pass in or um, making it easy for them to pass in options for, for things that, that, that the library that you're, you're wrapping uh, makes available. Um, but there are other concerns. So um, it's quite, so um, if we go back to Jio, there are loads of additional kind of functions available within Jio. So you can add things like, um, you can, after the initial object is made, you can call methods on that Jio, this uh, controller object that will add halo elements, and change colors and things like that. Um, in order to do that from R, you might that you might be tempted to add either additional parameters to your function um, definition or alternatively add um, a, kind of add functions in that you can that can be called in R um, and that kind of replicate the well you know that wrap the call to 
um, the, the the corresponding method. Um, the problem with adding too many um, additional parameters to your function call is it might make it difficult for people to learn how to use your package um, uh, in, initially. If you make hundreds of options available, it can be a bit daunting. Um, if you and, and also it can be it could probably be a, a maintenance burden if the API of, of, of the library that you're working with changes. Um, supposing, um, I don't know, an alternative is to, to add these kind of functions that maybe your R object gets piped into um, and which um, modifies how JavaScript works on the object once it's passed over. Um, yes, so you have to kind of think about how your R users are going to work with your functions and um, uh, think about, you know, if there are things that you don't want to implement from your library um, in your initial release of your HTML widget, do have a think about how you would implement um, access to that functionality from R because if you don't think about that when you're doing your initial kind of release you can hamstring yourself later I guess um, yes so that's this chapter um, uh, yes so there were a few example um, libraries um, mentioned at the end of this chapter that I, I thought looked quite interesting to to, to have a look at kind of working with. Um, and I think I'm probably going to have to, to um, make a repo and kind of work on it over a few weeks to, to get that to up and running really, because I, I had a look at AM charts, which has loads of kind of like animated visualization type uh, things. And the, the code to actually do it in JavaScript ran into, you know, 50 60 70 lines so i thought maybe this isn't the library to start with as a kind of first attempt but i think i might be able to make a a bar chart or two from that um in the near future um uh yes so that's this chapter and as that kind of covers um part that's that's kind of the end to part two of the book so at this stage we've seen a, a load of different kind of it, we've we've seen how to use html widgets to um, make javascript libraries available to our users such that they can use them in things like our markdown um, and, and pass data into them from shiny um, and um, we've seen how for each JavaScript library that you try and work with, there will be subtleties in how you actually interface with it from your HTML widget. It may require your data in a particular format, and it may require um, specific HTML elements on the page before it's able to be created and, and, and things like that. And we've seen a little bit about kind of how to design your package to make it easy to kind of maintain over the, you know, easy to maintain and make as much of the features of the library available as possible. Um, yes, so that's HTML widgets. Um, Arthur, you were quite interested in uh I, I i posted something in the slack channel about um making html widgets using react libraries um and there was a a kind of tutorial piece in um the react R vignette um, 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 um. Yeah, I think it's, hold on, no, 
Yeah, I'm going to have to dig back into that. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. thanks for posting that, Russ. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was quite interesting because really, like, um, it, it's a, a relatively minor additional step. You have to do a kind of, um, there's like a kind of build step involved. But a lot of the, 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 scaffolding and the uh, code to translate R over to JavaScript and thing. A lot of the things that we've learned in this section of the book will translate quite nicely to doing stuff with JavaScript libraries that you have to build first, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, so it does, it does look quite neat. So the, the thing that they do there, I mean, um, what was the... The library that they used was, um, I think they just made a kind of spinner or something. Oh no, it's this kind of line graph type thing that they made using Spark lines. Um, but it, it it was quite neat, I thought, um, and and kind of and is accessible to us, I think, now that we've learned the basics of HTML widgets. Um, yeah, you, you can you can take a look. It's very much nice, and it's built on top of HTML widgets, and so you've got ninety nine percent of it there. There's that indeed that additional build step because it uses uh, uh, some sort of npm preprocessor. I think I can't remember which one it is. Webpack, um, but other than that, everything remains the same. Other yeah. than of course you're using React, and you can also take a look at uh, if you're interested. View view R. Mm. It's the same as React as for Vue. It's built by also um, Kent, Kenton Russell, who I think I, I, I think in the book. Uh, okay. He's built React R and Vue R, and it's very much the same API, works the same way. Okay, okay. So there's a, a sort of consistency to um, the um, way of working with Vue R and React R as a result of it being the same author, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, cool. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so the next session that we're running, Lucio has offered to present, and it's the first chapter of the book where we're talking about communication from R to the browser and back. Um, so this is how we integrate. Um, we it, it it's around shiny so it's uh, the the whole of kind of part three seems to be focused on shiny i'll um i'll kind of advertise the the book club again because i suspect there might be a slightly different audience for a shiny themed section of the book than there would be for a html widgets themed um section i from having skimmed part three, there's obviously like um, some of the ideas in part two are useful, but a lot of it's it, it seemed more like kind of understanding the JavaScript scoping and things like that that will be useful in in part three, but not necessarily the um, you know knowledge of things like html widgets and stuff um but yeah it's um so it's quite an interesting section. i think that's the uh yeah and then there's a couple of more sections after that but um yes so how do you how do you feel that part two fits with the rest of the book john do you do you feel that it was kind of was it written as a kind of um a standalone thing so that it, it, it for for you to learn um how to uh build these html widget packages or was it was there a night in in your mind were you also setting up preliminary learnings for subsequent sections of the book as well no, a good question no in my mind there wasn't so very, i think no, no there is a link a tiny link uh, in the in in between those, but most of the of those chapters are 
uh, what do you say, can stand alone much otherwise. They don't, you don't need the previous section to follow the next uh, chapter. Um, there is only one thing where there is a section again at the very end of the chapter on shiny where you have uh, how you can make your the widgets that you work like the gyro that you have there or if you can design things that are very specific uh, to the widget yeah. in, in shiny uh, but other than that these, these, these are standard okay and um the well, I don't know. I don't know. I wanted to ask quickly if you are you, if you collect feedback on this or if I because I'm happy to share a form that people can work yeah, yeah, yeah. this or if it's just written. Yeah, no, well, I'll put it in thing. this. I would, I would ask now, but I think it's a bit if people really dislike the book, they're not going to tell me now. <laughs> my face. But so I really take any feedback. And one thing that I realized maybe on the first this first chapter is. The fact that it's building a widget bit by bit, you have to really keep up with it, right? You can't really skim a section of a book or something, or as you get lost and you suddenly you, you can't you can't follow along anymore. Um, at least I can tell you this is not the case for the rest of the book. Okay. 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 It can be it's, it's simpler in a sense. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, but um, yeah, if you want um to get feedback on the book, I'm quite happy to to send it around in the to to the slack channel and do, we could do it anonymously if you want or sure uh, i mean uh, however however people feel comfortable but i'm just keen on, on you know i'm trying to hopefully get a yeah yeah um, yeah I, I don't know i mean i was I, I, the, there are sections where it was um kind of, a, a lot of it is a kind of urging you to go away and experiment with other libraries and stuff and yeah. really i probably haven't done that as much as i probably ought to have done i think i would have learned a lot more but um yeah, yeah perhaps, uh, perhaps a bit lazy of me to <laughs> they use the reader to just stop reading and go and do something else but yeah no i certainly it's true it's true i do that a lot yeah one thing, John. I mean, I actually have a maybe quick, quick feedback, and then a, then a question that kind of radically changes directions. I mean, for for the quick feedback, unless I've missed it, and I may well have missed it. Um, I think it might have been useful to have like a repo of that, that kind of contained the geo geo example. Sep I, I don't quite know how to package that up. Whether it's just a separate re repo that's linked in the book. Uh, um. Uh, but I mean, that might've kind of helped with, with the, the reading, like if the reader reached a certain point and, um, yeah, what, right. what wasn't sure, like what the, what the solution code should be or, 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 you know, if they've, if they've kind of gotten it all that, that might've been, might've been yeah, useful. I mean, right, I mean, as, right. as it stands, I think with maybe the exception of the chapter on the, uh, what is it? The, uh, Kind of the crosstalk chapter. Um, I think, by and large, I think your the book contained like the, the full the full code. It was just kind of gradually and incrementally building up. I think with with that sole exception, I think it was good about that. But still, it might be nice to have the separate separate uh, entity. Yeah, I have the code online, but not for every step or every chapter or anything like that. I think I have the final code. I have uh, a repository for the book where that sits. But it's it's true. You're right. I should have I should have had something like this. But if you get lost, you can pick up from some 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 place. And then maybe also for the 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 the, the lazy the lazy readers, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who 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 maybe can't be bothered with kind of uh, working out an example themselves. Maybe having like a non-textual example that's completely worked that might be that might be useful. Kind of like appendix material in a certain in a certain sense. Uh, Okay. But like 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 Russ, I think you know there's frankly no substitute for working it through on your on your on your own. Uh, and probably the, our audience is apt to do that, but still maybe some some might appreciate additional example additional worked examples, I suppose. Sure. No, that makes sense. Thank you. Good. I actually one one question if I may. I, I don't know, Russ, were you about to come in with, with I, more no, feedback? No, carry on, carry on. Uh no, actually I, I had one question, uh John. It, um just kind of about your personal take on things um, for for this interface design bit of of, of the of this of this chapter. 
how would you encourage other people to come down on terms of like what should you just have all of uh, uh, kind of a JavaScript or libraries options um, have them pass you know kind of pass the dots to, to JavaScript in a certain sense or or are you on the lookout as well as kind of a package author for let's say options you think would be commonly used and maybe merit merit being kind of a standalone option. Sorry, I'm not sure if that's a very clear question, but I guess it's like, you know, on the continuum of, of heart, have everything be an option and, you know, have have just kind of the the, the, the three dots uh, to capture everything and pass it along to JavaScript, kind of where, where, where do you think kind of prospective JavaScript package authors uh, or wrapper authors should kind of, uh, could, should kind of endeavor to fall? Mm, it's a good question. I think I'm not sure, to be honest. I know that I've used the three dots in places, just like Russ said, and some of them is 3D, the, the, the parameters and the hundreds. Uh, and I don't see any other nice way of, of capturing those um, other than that. The real problem there is then documentation. What you're going to have in the R package documentation, you're going to have the ellipsis, and then you have to tell the user to go somewhere and hope that, well, the original documentation um, is clear and that the user of an R package is able to kind of understand it, even though it's, it's, it's rather simple in a sense. Um, what I think it's, what I mentioned is that I quite like, but I've done it very little to be honest, but it's kind of combining things, like I said. Like I think this Gio package to have individual functions that you pipe along, but you have uh, set colors, set background set this and that and there for example it, it, it feel a bit it feel a bit weird in our our users are probably more keen on like theme function that I think probably comes from from, from gg plot two um but but yeah I'm kind of on, on the fence and I don't really say anything I'm not being very specific in the package on purpose because I don't think I have the right answer myself but that's honestly the the kind of and that, to me, the interesting part of the work as well is you have something that's written in JavaScript for JavaScript users, and you want to make it not just accessible to, to our users. It's all about design and the interface. That's why we all like ggplot 2 and things like that. It's because it's well designed. So you have to, to, to bridge something so that you have idiomatic R code to produce nice JavaScript visualizations. That's where the kind of the, the difficulty is. Um, and there are, yeah, I think what I've, what I've said now and what I have in the book is about how much I kind of know about it. Then um, maybe trial and error sometimes, you know, the individual functions that you pipe, I've done it, and then they grow and they grow, and you start building pipes and pipes and pipes for your chart. Add this, add that, remove this. Uh, maybe it's not, not that elegant. It's, it's yeah, you'd, you'd have to try and see which one you prefer. I, I feel like maybe another factor in the this design decision might well be the quality of the documentation of the JavaScript library. So, for example, eCharts for R, you know, I, I've I've only recently discovered and, and quite quite like, but it seems like at least for one function that I'd use it, you know, uh, you're kind of more taking the approach of just you know any any option gets passed through uh, the three the three dots. But it, I think it works out quite well for the end user because. The documentation of of e charts is is uh, is good is is really quite good, uh, mm -hmm. but that may not always be the case. Yes, indeed, indeed, that's the that's the issue, that's the issue. And I'm not, but I, again, I'm not sure what the what, what the right solution is in the, in, in that case. Because if the if the if the original documentation is bad, then having three dots and sending the R user there is kind of demonstrate anything. Um, but what's the alternative really um, is difficult. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the oh, feedback, yeah. Arthur. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks ever so much for coming along, John. Um, I hope it's been useful to you. Um, and yeah, if you want to send us the um, a, a feedback form or, or whatever, I'll, um, I'll I can put it into Slack or link it to That's the. Good.
the the chat group um otherwise um we'll be uh, meet again next week to start um looking in the shiny side of the book uh, and lucio is going to be presenting um and yeah cool i look forward to seeing you all then um okay great okay thanks <laughs> i'll see thank you later you, everyone. thank you very much thanks so much bye-bye see you